firewalls, those things should be protecting access to the next layer into the infrastructure. Uh, those DMZ systems should be protecting access to the server at the server host layer. Uh, server hardening, host hardening should have been applied to protect access to the applications. And then you actually peel back the application security to see that there's access to the communication stacks and protocols that are used to then talk to the end devices. So if you follow the wire and use a defense in depth approach, you can make sure that all the rocks are turned over when you're doing an assessment of these systems. Uh, and then if you look at a diagram that depicts this, a physical security should then limit access to the digital assets. Then if you're following the, the, the line here, all of the network ar architecture, these things should be providing a defense in depth approach until you get down to the local controllers that control the system. So here's some quick thoughts, quick keys to keep in mind. If you're a security professional that has just been asked to be on a team that's gonna look at some real-time systems that involve SCADA systems, or if you're a security professional working for a company that is in the critical infrastructure arena, uh, know thy tools. <laughs> that's the very first thing. Uh, if you're going to launch Nmap or launch uh, whatever tools you want to use for uh, vulnerability assessment work, make sure that you're going very slow. Make sure you test those tools on an offline system first. Uh, the worst thing you can do is just uh, you know, point, click, shoot with vulnerability scanning tools with the SCADA infrastructure. Uh, the key is to use uh, a very passive approach. Uh, so it's, it's okay to do pen testing from the internet on into this, the corporate systems, and we've, we've actually been asked to penetrate from the corporate systems into SCADA, but once you start crossing that line into SCADA, all those pen testing concepts, pen testing tools need to be thrown out, and you, not, you need to kind of rethink how you do this. So instead of taking like a James Bond approach and just blasting in, you really need to take more like a sleuth approach and start kind of looking at the configs of these systems and pa passively capturing traffic and doing things that w in a way that wouldn't harm the system. And if you can scan uh, secondary systems or development systems that aren't in production, then that's game on, right? That gives you a lot more information if you can do an active scan. So uh, doing these things, as, like I said, over the last nine or 10 years, we've collected a lot of data. And uh, the end of 2008 and early 2009, uh, DHS con uh, wrote a contract with us to go through and mine through that data. We collected over 38,000 vulnerabilities in SCADA and critical infrastructure systems. And uh, here's a couple of the results that, we, that came out of this uh, research work that we did. First of all, we, we wanted to know where these vulnerabilities were discovered in this architecture model. Was it where they discovered at the controller layer uh, with the valves and pumps and, and equipment? Or was it at the HMI, the console that the operators are using? Or was this vulnerabilities always on the corporate side? So the first thing we did was uh, we were able to kind of sort our database and filter it based on different fields that we were capturing. And these are the types of things that we captured in our database. Uh, we, each vulnerability got a unique ID, uh, title, what security zone or location that vulnerability was found in the infrastructure. Uh, we also wanted to log uh, when that vulnerability was disclosed in the public and also the date when we discovered it. And that will come in handy when I go to the next slide because we wanted to detect how many days this vulnerability had been in the wild and known and disclosed versus when we discovered it in the system. And then we also always have a remediation uh, suggestion for the vulnerability. So we don't need no stinking O-days, okay? Uh, there's, there's a lot of people that are claiming, hey, we're researching SCADA O-days or we've got a boatload of SCADA O-days. It's, it's, you know, that's great, that's good, but you know what, you don't even need an O-day because what we found was that the average uh, number of days between when a vulnerability is disclosed in the public and there's a known exploit for that vulnerability and when it's detected in a SCADA environment is about 330 days or almost a year. So you can just roll into SCADA environments with all of your toolkits, Metasploit exploits that you have now and you will have no problem breaking into SCADA systems because uh, you don't need an O-Day. Uh, a lot of these vulnerabilities that we discovered are already known vulnerabilities in the systems. And uh, in fact, there was a few times when uh, we discovered vulnerabilities that had been in the public for a long time. In fact, one was almost seven years uh, that had been sitting there, latent in, this, in the infrastructure. Now, you would ask, like, you know, why, why is it taking so long for asset owners of these systems to discover the vulnerabilities, patch their systems, and clean up their mess? 
The problem is when you're running a, a SCADA system, there's, there's no downtime. It's not like you can say, we're going to take a maintenance outage at 6 p.m. We're going to shut down the SCADA system that's controlling electric power distribution system, and we're going to patch it because it has to run 24 by 7, right? So it's really difficult to patch these systems. A lot of times the vendors that source the, these systems into uh, production uh, have to vet the patch before it's done. So we've had many inst instances where our clients actually downloaded and installed a Microsoft patch or a, a Linux or Unix patch, and that patch actually broke the SCADA application. So the, it's very difficult for a SCADA asset owner or a SCADA engineer to maintain the systems in a secure way because uh, they have to make sure that the patch isn't going to break the system that, that they're managing. So the next thing we wanted to find out was, well, where were the vulnerabilities most discovered in this model? And what we found was the largest number of vulnerabilities were detected at the DMZ layer between the corporate IT system and the SCADA systems. And uh, here's some points about that. Uh, about almost half of the vulnerabilities we found was in that middle layer. Um, and what we find is that that middle DMZ layer is kind of like no man's zone. It's like the corporate IT guys don't really want to take ownership of those systems because many of those systems are SCADA components. So they don't really have the know-how to manage uh, like a PI OSI uh, data historian. They don't really know what that it takes to manage that type of system. And then you have the SCADA engineers that are pushing data out to this middle layer, but then it's being consumed by corporate and enterprise users and so they don't really think it's their job either. So they, they just say, well, you know, the IT guys are going to take care of that stuff over there. And so it's kind of like no one really takes ownership of that middle area of the infrastructure. So now we have this kind of perfect storm whereby the, this middle layer has the most vulnerabilities, yet it's the most connected to all of the critical infrastructure. Because once you, this middle, these middle layer components, database historians, web servers that are doing real-time uh, displays of data, uh, forwarding data to, to billing systems, trading systems, they have to be connected to everything in order that, for them to get the information. And they're trusted down into the SCADA environment. So once you're into that middle layer, you're pretty much home free in terms of what you can access. And you know, again, that, that SCADA DMZ network is the last line of defense before any traffic hits the SCADA network itself. And uh, like I said here, you know, many cases, these are trusted connections. So you can just ride on in to whatever the connections are already made. So what we wanted to do was take apart the vulnerabilities at that middle layer and then pull the sheet back and say, okay, well, where are the, what types of vulnerabilities are here? And let's go to the next layer of, of analysis. So what we did here was we then uh, looked at, it was about over, uh, a little bit over 18,000 uh, vulnerabilities, we rank them by the type of exploit that can be used uh, to exploit them. Actually, before I get there, we wanted to break down the vulnerabilities and the types of systems they were found on. And over half of them were web servers, business applications, and database servers, which we, we assumed that that would be the case because that's the function that that part of the network uh, serves. You're logging data, so it's going to be a lot of database servers there. You're pushing data back out. You're displaying data. There's going to be a lot of web portals. Well, if I were to cover up you know, the top part of this slide and just show you the bottom part of this slide and say that, uh, hey, we've got a lot of problems with web servers, a lot of problems with business applications, a lot of problems with database servers, you would say, hey, that just looks like the problems we're facing on the corporate side. You would, so it's the same types of components that are used on the SCADA side as well. So SCADA, how can I own thee? Let me count the ways. So uh, 18,000 vulnerabilities, all these types of exploits that can be used against them to gain access. Uh, so again, we did some analysis of that. And uh, these types of exploits are already known. You know, configuration problems, uh, patching problems, cross-site scripting, SQL injection. These are known attack uh, vectors, right? And these are the comprise the largest types of exploits that would work in the in the operational DMZ networks. So it's almost like we have this situation where we have a lot of vulnerabilities in a space that's connected to a lot of live critical infrastructure, and there's a lot of live exploits already written to take advantage of these things. So it's it's kind of like a ticking time bomb, and I'm, and I just hope that that uh, the message that we're getting here can be. Uh, you know, open a few eyes about the, the responsibilities that need to be taken to, to secure these systems down. 
So uh, the next thing we wanted to find out was, okay, so what type of operating system are these SCADA systems running on that has all these vulnerabilities? And it's, it's uh, not a surprise to us. Uh, over the past 10 years, a lot of the SCADA vendors have all ported their applications over to Microsoft. Uh, back in the 90s, uh, most of the SCADA systems that we worked with were Unix-based, and then they migrated their path up to Linux. Uh, but there was a big push in the 90s with Wonderware, uh, Intellusion. A lot of these Windows-based software packages were easier to work with, easier to maintain. So the larger SCADA systems, uh, such as like ABB and uh, Yokogawa, uh, all these systems, Televent for, on pipeline systems, all made the decision because their user base was screaming, hey, I want it on Windows. I know how to manage Windows, and I want a Windows solution for SCADA. So they just ported their applications over to Windows. Now the problem is you're doing the whole chasing the patch problem with Windows, having to go through upgrades every couple of years on the operating system, and it makes it harder, not easier, to secure your system when you're on a Microsoft system. And we're not here to poke holes at any one vendor, but I just thought it was funny because we, you know, as you're walking around in life and you see kind of funny things, it's kind of interesting to take pictures of stuff. And so this was a marketing booth, marketing Windows Vista, and they had a blue screen of death on it. So I thought that was kind of funny. Now, as you move down into the controller side, uh, you start thinking, okay, well, what kind of vulnerabilities are in the embedded devices that actually are controlling the, the plant processes, the boiler control systems, the PLCs, the RTUs? Uh, those aren't Microsoft. Those are typically like VxWorks or QNX, some type of really light uh, operating system. Uh, and what we found was 65% of the vulnerabilities down in that controller network were due to QNX. And QNX is pretty much uh, a large um, standard in which a lot of the embedded devices are built on top of. Uh, the next two pieces were vulnerabilities due to non-SCADA equipment. There's a lot of equipment that we have found on the SCADA system that were not used for SCADA functions, such as like uh, video surveillance systems, VoIP systems, because you know, they only have one connection point out to that remote facility, so they're running the SCADA protocols over the same channels that they're running their VoIP system over the same channels that they're running their video surveillance system, so uh, maybe card access systems that they're badging in and out of the plant with. So those types of systems were on the same logical network as the SCADA traffic as well. So it came up in our assessments. Now here's really interesting stuff. There's a whole bucket load of things that we found during our assessments over the past nine years that we really couldn't classify. We just thought it was kind of interesting. So we put a couple slides up here. Um, things like adult video directory scripts and online data, dating service databases and gaming software servers. Uh, the most interesting thing that we found was a Counter-Strike gaming server that had been started and ran in the SCADA control room because the you know, a lot of these systems were engineered to be you know, run in an automated fashion. I mean, it basically it ta automatically takes action to make sure the system's in balance. So the operators get bored at night. So they're like, well, hey, let's bring in a game server into the control room. And then somebody had an idea, let's connect another network card to it and connect it to the internet so that we can you know, get our buddies to play with us at night and so now you have a you know, direct feed from the internet into a Counter-Strike game server, which is then actually on the network that's running the plant. So uh, that's just one example. So, I mean, basically when we go in to do an assessment, we know we're gonna find this stuff because it's commonplace. It's, it's like uncommon to actually find a hardened system whereby USB ports are disabled, media is disabled, the system is on its latest patch, it's kind of like, whoa, I would love to see a system like that, but we have not yet seen that yet. Uh, we have yet to find an actual IDS system running on a SCADA environment in all of our assessments we've done. Now, they might have an IDS sensor on the corporate side of the firewall as it gets into SCADA, but once you're actually on the SCADA network, very little IDS, very little logging at all. In fact, sometimes we are get, we're involved in incident response. They're like, hey, this worm just shut down our platform, our offshore platform. Okay, well, let's look at what happened. Let's recreate the timeline. Well, they didn't turn on event logging on the operating system level. They didn't turn on logging at the SCADA application level. So there is no logs. And that's commonplace. So anyway, I'll skip to the next screen. Uh, so more interesting things, but wait, you know, there's more. Uh, botnet code, remote command and control malware, uh, Windows 95, we still find Windows 95 out there quite a bit. I mean, it's hanging on, it's like, yes, I can still run critical infrastructure 15 years after I was made. And uh, 
It's still there. We find a lot of IM clients.